Um, I'm Jim English. I'm the director of the Penn Humanities Forum. Thanks for coming tonight. It's rainy, um, and uh, it's great to, uh, great to see you all here for Sarah Richardson. Tonight's presentation by Professor Sarah Richardson is a co-sponsorship with our friends in the Department of the History and Sociology of Science. So we're grateful to the chair of that department, Robert Aronowitz, and uh, also the, um, uh, it's, uh, the, the other co-sponsor is the Alice Paul Center for Research in Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies. And um, the, du the director of that center is Nancy Hirschman, who is here, and, uh, and we're grateful to Nancy as well for, uh, for her co-sponsorship. The program on sex has been overseen by my brilliant colleague, Heather Love. She's the, uh, the R. Jean Brownlee Associate Professor of English, um, author of Feeling Backward, Loss and the Politics of Queer History, which is a book that shifted the whole field of, of queer studies and has become really indispensable for a generation of, of scholars in literary, uh, literary studies. Heather is going to introduce Professor Richardson, um, and so let's all uh, have a round of applause for Heather Love, the curator of this series. Okay, thanks, thanks everybody for coming out on this uh, rainy Wednesday, to rainy. Um, okay, I'm very, uh, very happy to welcome Sarah Richardson, the Loeb Associate Professor of the Social Sciences at Harvard, whose work adds a crucial dimension to our series on sex. Professor Richardson is jointly appointed in the History of Science Department and in the Committee on Degrees in the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at Harvard. Her scholarship addresses questions of gender and race in the life sciences and offers a model of socially engaged interdisciplinary work on the making of scientific knowledge. In her influential and critically acclaimed book, Sex Itself, The Search for Male and Female in the Human Genome, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2013, Professor Richardson considers the history of attempts to stabilize gender through recourse to genetics. From the discovery of the X and Y chromosomes at the beginning of the 20th century to the mapping of the human genome, human sex chromosomes have become increasingly significant as they have been understood as the hard biological basis for cultural gender norms. Richardson draws on the tradition of feminist science studies as well as contemporary work on race and genomics to interrogate the epistemological and methodological grounds of contemporary genetics research. For those of us working on the cultural dimensions of sex and gender, this account of chromosomes as, quote, gendered objects of scientific knowledge is crucial since it so usefully illuminates the biosocial complex that naturalizes gender hierarchy. Professor Richardson has also co-edited two books, uh, Revising Race in a Genomic Age from 2008 and Post-Genomics, Perspectives on Biology After the Genome, which was published earlier this year. She's currently working on a book uh, tentatively titled The Maternal Mystique, which traces the history of research on maternal effects. That tradition of research has traced the influence of mothers' behavior, exposures, and physiology on the health and well-being of their offspring. This book promises, like sex itself, uh, the book, not the thing, um, <laughs> to clarify what is at stake in a fraught and consequential area of biomedical research by taking on the shifting relationship between nature and nurture in the modern life sciences. So today, Professor Richardson will be speaking about epigenetics and how to assess the impact of new theories of plasticity and environmental influence. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sarah Richardson. Um, thanks for that wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to be part of this series, and what I hope to do today is to talk a little bit about how the concept of sex is operationalized and used in the contemporary life sciences. Um, as Heather mentioned, I'm a historian of science, I'm a philosopher of science, and I'm a gender studies scholar, and I'm also deeply engaged with the science. And so I hope to, that you'll learn something about all four of those areas today. Um, Here's Charlotte Perkins Gilman, the feminist philosopher and activist in 1898, known for her pithy quips, um, uh, saying, the brain is not an organ of sex, might as well speak of a female liver. Well, here we are in 2015, and uh, feminists are talking a very different talk, or at least some feminists are. Uh, here is Janine Clayton, the head of the NIH Office for Research on Women's Health, saying just last year, 
every cell has a sex. Each cell is either male or female, and that genetic difference results in different biochemical processes within those cells. So this is the expansive space into which I'm entering, changing conceptions of where we locate biological sex in the body. Now, sexual science, as I call it, has changed significantly throughout history. Let me just put that down there. Um, the search for sex over time has been conditioned by the uh, technologies we have available, the science of the day, and our political conceptions. So uh, we've moved from the blood to the pelvis to the skull to the brain to the hormones, and now a genomic conception of sex. And this, and conceptions of sex have also moved back and forth between a more binary and essentialist model that suggests that there is an essence to males and to females, um, and that they are really two quite different things, um, and an alternative model that emphasizes the overlap between the sexes, the variation within each sex, um, and the context specificity of any differences that we might observe between them. Now, by way of getting into the current uh, tense set of contestations around sex in biology, I'm going to show you a brief video by leading sex chromosome scientist David Page. Um, this is just a clip from a TED talk he did um, about 18 months ago. He's a Y chromosome geneticist, and here is one perspective of a leading life scientist on sex in the genome. It has been said many times that our genomes are all 99.9% .9 identical from one person to the next. This idea that we're 99.9% .9 identical has gained great traction, and for a number of reasons. It's very appealing to say that we're all 99.9% .9 identical. It's so appealing that this idea was seized upon by President Bill Clinton in his 2000 State of the Union address when he stated that this fall at the White House, we had a distinguished scientist visiting, an expert in this work on the human genome, and he said that we are all, regardless of race, genetically 99.9% .9 the same. Well, it turns out that this idea is even correct, as long as the two individuals being compared are both men. It's also correct if the two individuals being compared are both women. However, if you compare the genome of a man with the genome of a woman, you'll find that they are actually only 98.5% identical. In other words, the genetic difference between a man and a woman is 15 times the genetic difference between two men or between two women. Let us consider, for example, the case of Bill and Hillary. <laughs> so it turns out that Bill is as genetically similar to Hillary as he is to a male chimpanzee. <laughs> but human genome, we have a problem. In the human genome era in which we're living, this difference, this fundamental difference between males and females has been overlooked. Instead, we have been operating with a unisex vision of the human genome. And so, <clears throat> in fact, men and women are not equal in their genomes, as I've just explained. And so here's the 
here is one version of that binary and essentialist conception of sex being recreated in genomic terms. And this notion that males and females are very different, so different they are like different species, has been repeated by many leading geneticists in this research area. Here's Hunt Willard of Duke University suggesting that males and females differ by 2% greater than the hereditary gap between humankind and its closest relative, the chimpanzee, and this very provocative claim that there is not one human genome, the universalist promise of the Human Genome Project, but two, male and female. So again, this is the space that my book, uh, Sex Itself, The Search for Male and Female in the Human Genome, was entering into. Um, in this book, I look at how the discovery of the sex chromosomes at the turn of the 20th century instigated a historically novel understanding of sex determination rooted in the visually compelling binary of the X and Y, and how ever since then we've been trying to understand how to reconcile our cultural understandings of sex and gender with this materialist biological basis of sex and gender. I look at the X and Y, as Heather said, of, at, as gender objects of scientific knowledge. I try to analyze the production of claims of sex differences within this field and model how gender assumptions in the wider culture played a role in that. So if we start to ask questions um, about this science, um, what do we find? If we pick up the corners around these sorts of claims, do males and females have different genomes? Does every cell, in fact, have a sex? I want to give you some critical tools for thinking about these sorts of claims. Now, let me back up first and talk about chromosomes. What are they? Um, they are strands of tightly coiled DNA, kind of like bundles of genes, and humans have 23 chromosomes, uh, pairs of chromosomes, that is. Uh, males have 22 and females have 22 that are identical in males and females. Both males and females have one X, and males also have uh, a second a, a chromosome called the Y, and females have a second X chromosome instead of the Y. Now, this notion of the sex chromosome, the X and Y as the sex chromosomes, as I show in my book, led to um, a sex chromosome-centric way of thinking about the biology of sex, so that researchers assumed that male traits would be found on the Y chromosome and female traits would be found on the X, and that the X was the female chromosome and the Y the male, that the X would even behave in a feminine manner and the Y in a masculine manner. And this has led to all sorts of funny business in the history of genetics. One of my favorite case studies that I write about in the book is the history of theories of the XYY super male. In the 1960s and 1970s, um, researchers suggested that rare males who are born with an extra Y chromosome could explain male crime, that they would have, in essence, an extra dose of maleness. Um, this theory turned out to be terrifically wrong and to lead to the stigmatization of individuals with an extra Y chromosome. Um, and it instantiates quite literally the idea that an extra Y was like extra maleness. Um, this uh, actually XYY research established the Y chromosome in <laughs> popular and scientific consciousness as a symbol for maleness, even if the final empirical results of research after two decades of research on it undid that association, the um, popular conception really uh, remained. This is a comes out of a thrilly, thriller series from the 1970s called The XYY Man, um, a series of kind of crime novels. Uh, and the, there was actually a TV series based on this as well. Okay. Uh, let's start to interrogate this. Actually, the X and Y chromosomes are not female and male. Um, it, the first way we can go at this is to look at their actual role in sex determination. And we can see from this chart that the sex chromosomes are not sufficient to produce uh, phenotypic, what we call, you know, typical male and female uh, sex. That is, you need to be a male, you need 
um, not just to be XY, but to have this thing called SRY. You need to be positive for the SRY gene on the Y chromosome to produce testes. It's really this one gene on the Y chromosome. Um, the testes then produce gonadal hormones, androgens and estrogens, in a ratio that then produces a typical fertile reproductive male and the same kind of story for females. It's not that you need two X chromosomes, it's that you need to lack the SRY gene. Um, so the X and Y are not sufficient to produce sex, but part of a larger pathway of sexual development involving all of these factors coming together in, at the right time. Moreover, within the genome as a whole, sex factors, that is various factors involved in sexual development and differentiation, are not localized to the X and Y chromosomes. Um, and furthermore, the XX and XY gene complement functionally deliver almost the same identical gene content. Why is this? Well, the Y chromosome evolutionarily evolved from an ancestral X chromosome, and most of its content, uh, content is, um, has a homologue on the X chromosome. So that is, there are only a few genes on the male, on the Y chromosome that are actually specific and exclusive to males. So of the genes on the Y chromosome, 29 of them are in the region shared with the X. Okay, so that means identical with what a female will have. 25 of them outside of this region shared with the X um, are, have copies also on the X chromosome because of that ancestry. So we're down to maybe about 15 genes that are male specific on the Y chromosome. Um, we're talking out of about 20,000 to 30,000 genes. Um, and therefore, um, and also, um, functional analysis of these 15 or so genes shows that many of them are pseudogenes. That means uh, they actually do not functionally code for proteins that are functional in the body. Many of them are duplicates of each other, producing exactly the same gene product. Um, and these genes are not globally involved in sex differences, but are involved exclusively in male-specific processes in the testes. Um, furthermore, as I mentioned before, key genes involved in human sexual development are um, not localized to the X and Y chromosome. The estrogen receptor genes are on chromosomes 6 and 14. The, the androgen receptor gene, androgen associated with maleness, is located on the X chromosome. CAH is con congenital adrenal hy hyperplasia, and that is um, one uh, a major um, syndrome of disorder of sexual development. That's located on chromosome 6. 5-alpha reductase is another intersex condition, and that's uh, controlled by a gene on chromosome 2. Here are some major genes involved in sex determination. That is, if you have the wrong, an error in any one of these genes, you will be a sex-reversed XX male or XY female. Chromosome 1, 9, and 17. So sex in the genome doesn't look so much like this, but more like this. That is, there are genes that are critical and important to sex differentiating and sex determining processes all across the genome. Now, um, as, so as to this question of whether there's a male genome and a female genome, um, this kind of, once we begin to pick up the corners around this, this emerges as a highly problematic extrapolation from the X and Y binary to a global notion of sex differences. Instead, it looks like there are ways in which the genome is used in different ways by differently morphed bodies to produce a, a, a range of sexual variation. If you're interested in my specific deconstruction of the idea that males and females are like different species, like humans and chimpanzees. Here's an article I published a few years ago on that problematic line of reasoning, which actually has a deep history in scientific ways of thinking about sex. Now, um, Heather said, I'm going to talk about epigenetics. How many people know what I might mean by epigenetics? Okay, good number of you, yeah. So epigenetics, uh, now that critique, all that critique that I just gave you was based on a very a different notion of the genome than the one that is popular today. That notion of the genome um, was one of the genome as consisting solely of DNA sequence, consisting of those 23 pairs of chromosomes and their sequence. Well, we're, under, we're in a revolutionary moment, a major shift 
underway in the way in which the genome itself is conceptualized. Away from this genome as just a string of base pairs to one um, of a regulatory apparatus, a reactive system um, in which the genome is also composed of the regulatory apparatus that decides when parts of it are turned on and turned off. And this is transforming right now, over the past five years, how we do basic research on sex, gender, and sexuality. This area of research that I wrote about in the book is already transforming um, to move toward an understanding of how hormones and genes di interact dynamically and throughout the life course to regulate sex differentiating processes. So epigenetics is a growing science across all fields of the life sciences. It's a post-genomic science in that it has emerged since the conclusion of the major sequencing projects as a major post, a major area of investment for continued work on genomics. Um, epigenetic mechanisms include, I'll be talking most prominently about things like DNA methylation. So here, uh, a, a, a methyl mark, um, a methyl group, CH3, is appended to the sequence of the, to, to the structure of the genome itself. And when it's appended, it represses gene activity. So you can have methylation and you can have demethylation um, as processes turning on and off different parts of the genome. And histone modification, I had to add DNA acetylation, microRNAs, and we're adding, adding, adding uh, different cofactors that could be considered epigenetics practically every day. Um, so what does this look like in terms of sex differences? Um, we're looking at things like um, uh, methyl CPG binding proteins working to repress um, or activate different parts of the genome to then produce different pathways of differentiation leading to sexually dimorphic epigenomes. So this is a radically different way of thinking about sex than what David Page was talking about in that video I showed you. I want you to pay attention to some of the key phrases here. Um, this is by a UCLA sex chromosome geneticist, Art Arnold, who's been one of the main art architects of this new way of thinking about sex. Uh, complex inter intersecting causal pathways, gene networks pulsating with activity, dynamic net of interactions, Okay, we're looking at a totality of sex bias factors in the network comprising what he calls the sex ohm. All right, so this is a kind of living, breathing, dynamic way of thinking about sex and gender. Pretty interesting and exciting. It, it suggests the presence of sex-specific processes and pathways throughout the genome, not restricted to genes or chromosomes conventionally linked to classic reproductive sexual traits. Um, so in this model, you've got um, some epigenetic factors, playing a role along with, or, or rather, you've got a bunch of cofactors. You've got your hormones, you have your genes, um, you have, I'm not gonna get into all these cofactors, and then they're, they're mediated through things like methylation to create, over time, long-lasting sex-specific modifications. All right. Um, I'm gonna give you an example of this approach by describing a recent study from a researcher at University of Maryland, uh, Margaret McCarthy. The study is titled, Brain Feminization Requires Active Repression of Masculinization via DNA Methylation. Um, this study, um, the conclusions of which are summarized in this figure, found reduced activity of DNA methyltransferase enzymes in the male rat preoptic area of the brain. Um, suggesting that the masculine phenotype in rats is produced by demethylation or releasing quote unquote masculinizing genes from epigenetic repression. The study further showed that inhabit inhibiting DNA methyltransferase with a drug or knocking out it, those genes created a masculinizing effect in adult female rats. Don't worry if you didn't understand any of that. I'm gonna unpack what it means um, by describing some of the key, um, very challenging, exciting findings of this study. So the study can be read 
as challenging received understandings of the sexual dimorphism of the brain at several levels. First, in contrast to a view of male and female brains as organized and hardwired during early development, the study conceptualizes um, the, uh, this finding as showing that the, quote, neuronal DNA methylome is highly modifiable with rapid demethylation and de novo methylation occurring in response to changes in excitability, particularly in genes uh, associated with neural plasticity. Okay, so modifiable. Second, rather than viewing the female condition as the passive default in the absence of masculinizing factors, and if you're familiar with notions of gender across many fields, you'll recognize the construct of uh, femaleness as passive and maleness is active. So in contrast to that, this, the authors flip the script, okay? Um, they interpret the experimental manipulability of male or female phenotype in the rat brain via these epigenetic factors as, quote, confirming that feminization is the active process of suppressing masculinization via DNA methylation. Without methylation, a masculine phenotype can emerge in female rats, that is, even in adulthood. So hence they conclude that, uh, quote, feminization is the active process of suppressing masculinization via DNA methylation, and further, that this finding is evidence for the duality of the brain, with some arguing for the simultaneous presence of both male and female circuits or phenotypes. Wow. And third, the author suggests that methylation is on balance a means of preventing far greater sex differences in the brain. So out of um, the 381 genes that they looked at, only 70 showed sex differences, with 34 more highly expressed in females and 36 more highly expressed in males. Methylation, that is, this epigenetics, assured equal levels of gene expression in those 381 other genes, uh, which, with the, which the authors called convergence genes. One of these genes is the much expressed FOXP2 gene, which some have associated with language abilities. So these, these are big, uh, possibly big findings. Um, that the authors show that there is pressure toward the convergent expression of these genes in males and females in reproductively relevant brain regions. Okay, so of course, um, from a feminist perspective, this is really quite intriguing. Uh, people like me are very interested in models of how gender, that is the social norms and expectations associated with masculinity and femininity, is corporealized within the biological sex body. And this looks like it's going to offer us some mechanisms for thinking about that. With its emphasis on the reactivity and responsiveness of the body to social and environmental influences, epigenetics offers a potentially rich and provocative theoretical frame for understanding sex and gender at the level of the body. And feminist intellectual traditions have long conceptualized gendered minds and bodies as deeply conditioned by social and historical context. Um, not only Charlotte Perkins Gilman, writing in that 1898 treatise, where she famously argued that the social conditions of subjugation had created, quote, rudimentary female creatures weak in body and servile in mind, um, and contended that sexual inequality between the sexes was produced and maintained not just by social factors, by, but by social factors working in interaction with the body and biology, um, where she predicted that with greater equality, women would grow physically larger and stronger and more agile. Um, but actually, even in the genomic age, uh, in the 1970s, um, here's Joanna Russ in her feminist science fiction classic, The Female Man. It follows uh, this pathway of interest in plasticity by constructing an elaborate feminist parable, making very much the same point. The book features a meeting between four women with identical genomes, but from different time periods with different gender conventions. And it brings them together in this this time traveling experiment and shows them having very different ways of being in the world, postures, modes of interacting, health statuses, and so on. So, uh, and most recently, any orphan black fans? 
All right. Uh, so most recently, the BBC America science fiction series Orphan Black, which is praised for its scientific acumen as well as feminist vibe, features this um, uh, thought experiment as well. It's a single act actress who plays eight different versions of contemporary women with identical genomes. The television show is a gender-bending phantasmagoria um, and shows the clones living wildly divergent lives. Um, uh, my favorite is um, the timid lesbian scientist Cosima, uh, but, and she contrasts strongly with the uptight straight-laced soccer mom, Allison. Um, there's even a transgender character, Tony. Um, so the show's writers actually in the script regularly invoke epigenetics as an explanation for this rainbow of characters. So I mention all of this because these compelling visions of gender plasticity form an imaginary that it animates historically and today intrigue with any sort of plasticity affirming biological theory. And um, attending to the materiality of gender plasticity in the body many people think, um, is a way to ultimately promote greater social tolerance and acceptance of marginalized forms of gender expression. And I just invoke um, the uh, feminist scientist Elizabeth Wilson uh, call that for us to, those of us who are feminists and gender scholars, to really think about biological substrates and to actually think about them not just as a resistant materiality but as another scene, not a met bedrock, and to cultivate attitudes towards this biology that are speculative and engaged, fascinated, surprised, enthusiastic, amused, or astonished. Um, that said, even though there is this great affirmation of plasticity and epigenetics, we shouldn't lose our critical edge. And I want to encourage some critical and empirical analysis of practices in this field. I've been tracing and tracking research on sex and epigenetics over the past five years. And it's fair to say that actually, taken as a whole, this body of research is currently committed far more to providing causal explanations of the programming sort than of the plasticity sort. That is, in this field, epigenetics, you know, by people in the field, is understood as a mechanism that can explain the fixation and maintenance of hormonal effects established in early life creating binary sex differences. So now let's return to this paper that I've had so much excitement about, this McCarthy paper from uh, University of Mar Maryland. So exciting. It seems to be a thrilling and intellectually challenging rewriting of long-held paradigms um, of profound and fixed differences in the biology of the brain, right? Um, and it suggests that differences once understood as hardwired are perhaps more accurately understood as tripwired, held in place by rather delicate and contingent processes um, that are open to reversal. It opens the possibility of imagining a diversity of sexual phenotypes, right? Um, not only within a population, but even over an individual's life course, um, and of considering environmental and social mediators of sex-related gene expression. But let's read what the scientists say about what this study means. Here's Geert de Vries, a prominent neuroendocrinologist at University of Massachusetts. Um, and he, the public discussion that followed the publication of this um, study among scientists shows that the, the field actually received that study as showing how epigenetics works to overdetermine and fix in place sex differences in the brain. So here's de Vries saying that this study, um, that our understanding that the female state of the brain is the default still stands. What changes now because of the study is our thinking as to how that default state is preserved. Um, here's a New Scientist article reporting on the study, quoting many scientists discussing it. And it asserts that taken together, these latest findings suggest that there be, may be more sex differences in the rodent brain than previously thought. And here's the lead author of the study herself, Bridget Nugent, um, saying what she thinks the study shows. My hope is that these studies, meaning new epigenetic approaches to the brain, have taken us one step closer to fully understanding how and why males and females are so different. In this paper, we've shown a mechanism whereby hormones create sex differences in the developing brain by producing sex-specific patterns of DNA methylation, 
Maintenance of the DNA methylation patterns established during sexual differentiation of the brain appears to be necessary to sustain the brain's differentiated state. All right. So I want to offer some reflection in three areas, looking at ways in which uh, epigen their plasticity affirming biology within epigenetics has another side to it. There's also a strong discourse of programming and binary and essentialist notions of sex differences coursing through these new plastic conceptions of the body. So first, in the emerging post-genomic systems and network-based science of sex with epigenetics at its center, plasticity and complexity is not opposed to programming. Rather, it is positioned as a powerful, that is, epigenetics is positioned as a powerful, powerful over-determining agent in the canalization and programming of sex differences, not despite, but because of its plasticity. So um, epigenetics is seen as a redundant or overdetermining mechanism that carries out and maintains the persistence of classic well-established hormonal processes implicated in sex differences. Second, Male and female epigenetic plasticity in response to the environment in this literature is itself theorized as sexually dimorphic. So when I look at this, I actually find that uh, in the literature, the inquiry is focused on epigenetics as a source for the elucidation of the biology of sex differences in responses to the environment not on how environmental exposures create variation in sex stereotyped behavior in males and females. So um, inquiry is presently focused on epigenetics, um, uh, not, is not focused on epigenetics linking social environment and brain and behavioral phenotype, for example. Um, instead, it is interested in how these key pathways um, re, re, uh, are themselves male and female specific. Third, and here's where I'm going with this for the concluding part of the talk. Um, these new plastic spreading network-like ne network -like systems theories of sex in the genome establish sex as a far more ubiquitous mechanism in the molecular architecture of the body than do previous genomic conceptions of sex. So in explanatory models in the biology of sex that invoke epigenetics, sex in, and gender become ubiquitous processes not localized to gross regions of sex, sexual dimorphism. So epigenetics does not merely mediate sex-specific processes at the interface of hormones and the genome in early development and throughout the lifespan. But epigenetics postulates sex as a much broader part of the substructure of the gene-environment interrelation. In this model, rather than epigenetics or the environment becoming a resource to explain social variation, sex differences itself becomes an expanded explanatory resource for explain, explaining biological variation itself. So in the epigenetics paradigm, in short, Every gene network, cell, and organ is seen as being um, within a networked system that itself is sexed. In the, so it, within a system that is mediated by sexed epigenetic processes. So while on the one hand, this new sexome approach represents a significant reformulation in the conceptualization of core processes of sexual determination and development, um, it renders the genome a dynamic product of its milieu. It problematizes any essential understanding of sex. It looks, according to this new view, like sexual processes can vary mosaic-like over time from cell to cell and body to body in ways that might obviate talking about a male genome and a female genome. At the same time, in the 20th century linear model of sex, sex that old model, sex inherited only in sex-specific elements, like the X and the Y, or the genes involved in reproductive organs, such as the testes and ovaries. In this new model, the epigenetic model, the whole body is imbued with networked processes that are sexed. So conceptualizing any process that involves genes or hormones as sexed, this model greatly multiplies the signs and signifiers of biological sex at the molecular level.
So now I want to return to this mantra of every cell having a sex. Um, this has emerged as a um, kind of tagline for women's health activists. Um, it's a consensus view in certain elite women's health circles um, that every cell has a sex, and it emerges from a very focused research program to develop a sex-based biology over the last decade or so. Um, and you can see how closely tied in this is to the emergence of a genomic and genetic understanding of sex. So the Society for Women's Health Research uses the slogan, what a difference an X makes, and because sex, double X, matters. Um, so it's very important to them, this new research on the genomics of sex, for emphasizing the need for more funding and so on for women's health research. This has been a concerted effort to develop a field if you're interested in the sociology of science, it's a good model of how you create conferences, um, major research statements. You create a whole organization founded in 2007, the Organization for the Study of Sex Differences. Um, and you produce a new journal, Biology of Sex Di Differences, founded five years ago. And um, this entire program is focused on finding differences. So here, I'll just skip ahead to this report, a major report that they produced out of this effort, an important study, 2001, arguing that sex matters, here's the sex chromosomes, and that every cell has a sex, it matters in ways it, uh, we didn't expect, it must matter in ways that we have not even begun to imagine. I won't show this video, but uh, if you're interested more in this paradigm, um, take a look at some of the videos, What a Difference a Sex Makes by the Society for Women's Health Research. It's a profound affirmation of very traditional, stereotypical notions of sex differences. In this video, um, they go around and interview regular folks about sex differences and that they believe in, and then use this to suggest the need for studying um, genetic differences between males and females. The most um, profound impact of all of this activation has been um, the achievement of a new policy at the National Institutes of Health. It was announced just last year. It's going into implement implementation now, um, requiring all researchers funded by the National Institutes of Health to consider sex as a variable in preclinical research. Now, you may know that starting in the 1990s, all researchers who study living whole human beings were required to include both women and men in their research. That was an important breakthrough for women's health. This is a different policy that requires all researchers to consider sex when they're looking at cells in a petri dish. Um, so this is a major policy shift. And so now the question of whether every cell has a sex is not just theoretical, but it has policy implications for actual practices all across the sciences. And we have to ask ourselves, is this a conception of sex that we're comfortable with? Is sex, in other words, omnipresent? Does every cell have a sex? Why do we want to think that way? Um, as we engage this hypothesis, this provocative idea, which is not determined by the data of the world, but by our ways of thinking, our concepts of sex, our pragmatic explanations and platforms that we bring to the life sciences. It's worthwhile to revisit Michel Foucault, the sex theorist, um, and his admonition that the signs of sex on the body do not speak for themselves as matters of fact outside of history and discourse. That is, um, there's a way in which the concept of sex um, is used to create artificial unities that give force to notions of sex differences within politically formed moments. So he says uh, that one way in which these notions of many biological markers of sex um, are used is to create a fictitious unity as a causal principle, an omnipresent meaning, a secret to be discovered everywhere. Now, there are some good reasons we might want to say every cell has a sex. We might want to bring awareness to sex-related variables so as to expose androcentrism in science. That is, maybe it's a bad thing if most of the cells researchers are using in labs are, in fact, from, uh, do from male donors. Um, we might want to capture the full range of biological diversity by studying cells derived from differently sexed and gendered bodies. We might want to mobilize, and I see this is what's really happening, 
to mobilize gender justice dis discourses to compel or direct resources, that is to create special um, lines of funding in a competitive research environment, and also to address, of course, women's health disparities. I actually think three and four are really bad reasons and not true. And I'm happy to be able to just point to my new paper coming out next Tuesday in Proceedings, oh, that's cut off down there, um, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, stating all the many reasons that I actually oppose this new policy. Um, that is, um, I do think, my own view is the claim that every cell has a sex represents an extreme instance of ascribing sex to the factors and parts of the body in a highly binary and essentialist way, that it contributes to a notion of sex as a ubiquitous or pervasive signifier or sign, and to a conception of, of bodies as divided in a thoroughgoing way into maleness and femaleness. And so I think it's actually unethical, but I also think it's empirically underdetermined, and it's conceptually un unsophisticated, and it's likely to use, lead to confusion and muddle in the scientific literature. So there you go. Now, what I've tried to do today, I'm just going to wrap up, um, is to encourage reflection on how we use the concept of sex in biology, um, and especially in these new molecular sciences when we're thinking about sex at every cell. And I've also tried to suggest that we're in a really critical and contested moment as the concept of the genome itself is transforming, and that will modify our sciences of sex and gender. And as new discourses of plasticity emerge and new celebrations of plasticity, right, um, we need to remain critical and analytic. Plasticity and programming are not necessarily opposites, but two sides of the same coin. Um, I've suggest that our, I suggest that our conception of sex that we use every day, that we use in biology, is not determined by our empirical fi findings in the laboratory, but it's also shaped by our pragmatic and explanatory aims, including things like building platforms in the biological sciences from which we can do other research, including things like social justice goals, and including things like opening funding avenues in the sciences. I think we should be aware of the overuse or ex really expansive use of the concept of sex itself. We should be aware that it's part of our social ontology as well as our biological ontology, and we should use it in a critical, uh, conditional, and reflexive way. And we should also work to innovate terminology to leave open the possibility of a radically different future. Thank you. Hi. Uh, where does the existence of an XY, XX chromosome enter into the genetic tree? Is it something that's common to all primates, to all mammals, to all animals? Yes. To male, female plants? Ah, okay. So um, the, um, okay, great question. Thank you. Uh, the sex chromosomes, that is some sort of system in which you have heterogametic chromosomes in one of the sexes, have evolved six different times independently in the history of evolution. Um, that is in different phylogenetic histories. Um, it is not necessary to have sex chromosomes in order to get sex. So plant, some plants, um, some um, like turtles, for example, and other organisms, uh, sex is determined by temperature and other environmental factors. Um, so sex chromosomes are not necessary to get sex in nature. And there are multiple conformations of the sex chromosome binary in nature. So in birds, for example, it's the females who have the XY, and it's males who are XX. So there's no essential relationship between an XX um, chromosome complement and a female, for example. So um, when did it evolve? Um, about uh, somewhere between, um, I think I, I say it in my book. Uh, I might need to get a correction on this, but it's, it's three to six million years ago. It's very old. I think uh, almost all mammals have sex chromosomes. However, the sex chromosome systems and how their, what their relation is to the actual pathway of determining um, a testes versus an ovary is different 
across many species. And there are some species in which the Y chromosome has disappeared within mammals. So the famous example of that is voles. Um, some species have lost their Y chromosome. So the sex determination system is XX in female and X, just X, in, in males. So I, I probably haven't covered the whole terrain there, but just enough to give you a sense. It's very old in the mammalian line. <laughs> And Furley, I actually have two questions, whether you need me to pick. Um, so um, I'm a geneticist interested in studying the, the genetics of gender. Um, one thing that I noticed was your use of the word sex as opposed to or combined with the use of the word gender. Um, and a lot of my use of those terms is informed by sort of the social justice concept from trans community. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to your choice of those words from your study. And then I have a second question if I'm allowed later. Yes, I'm using the term sex in a rather conventional sense uh, within the construct of the sex gender distinction. Um, and I'm embracing the idea that for the most part, um, we think of the um, biological signs and signifiers of sex on the body, such as the X and Y chromosome as sex, as opposed to gender. But actually, if you want me to get really tongue-tied, we should always be thinking in terms of gender sex, um, that we assume that it, these objects are outside of that frame. Um, so uh, gender, that is, refers for those who don't know, refers to the norms and expectations around masculinity and femininity. And sex refers, most usually, uh, to these um, signs and signifiers of sex in the body. But the problem is um, they interact intensively. Um, and so if you observe a sex difference uh, in levels of gene expression, or if you put someone in an MRI, um, you have to then do empirical work to determine what caused that sex difference that sex difference? Is it from within only, or is it through interaction with the way in which we order bodies very, very differently in the world? Um, I'm really excited that you're interested in doing epigenetic research on sex and gender differences. So as you see here, I, th I think there's lots of potential for that, and it's not there yet. And so I'm just waiting for these fabulous researchers to come forward and start asking the questions that this technology gives us the potential to ask. So we're in an enormous moment of contestation, and there are those who want to use it to look at traditional canalizing binary processes, and those who see the possibility of finally empirically studying how social processes can change biological processes. So how do you view uh, these new epigenetic discoveries um, such as sex existing uh, in a variety of different ways and factors uh, that contribute in uh, dimorphism and differentiation in the body. How do you view that those new discoveries as giving possible support um, for uh, the, the notion of gender and sex existing on a spectrum? Ah, well, of course, um, uh, I think that they do open up that possibility. Um, I mean, uh, it's an empirical question, right? It isn't something we just come to, we assert. Um, and I do think, though, um, what, you, what these ways of thinking about sex do is they multiply the range of cofactors involved in biological processes. And it seems almost inevitably they will produce a greater range of variable phenotypes and underlying mechanisms for that. Um, and so it could be affirming of variation, but as you see here, ways of thinking in the life sciences are very strongly fixed. And even such findings can be quickly interpolated into a binary way of thinking about sex. So it's going to be a contestation, I think. In other words, um, the fundamental conceptual debate is still going to be there on the table. Um, and uh, different methods of approaching the research, um, different practices are probably going to determine whether people go one way or another. And just what questions they ask from the beginning. It's so important to the science we actually create, what questions we ask at the beginning, right? And how we frame them. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, I feel like that's a perfect lead in then to my, my, my second question, which I suppose um, you dealing, it sounds like, with a lot of people of my ilk who will not surprise you. Um, maybe you can help me reframe my question. So the question really is for those of us who are trying, who are interested in trying to ask the kinds of questions that you're talking about. Um, I would love, and maybe that's the book right there, I would love a book, an article, a checklist, something to help me step back and think about you know, how much am I framing this particular research question or this, this grant specific aims in terms of what I've been trained for the last you know, 40 years, um, and how much am I framing it, you know, and not framing it in, in lost ways of, of thought from sort of past learning, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. You can see that I'm beaming. Uh, <laughs> this is exactly the kind of work we have to do, because if you're going to do that, then um, you know, gender is an area of expertise, and it's a literature, right? Um, and so really strongly engaging with that, that expertise, and I just, I'm so happy to see your openness and excitement about, about that. Um, so there, is, there are a lot of resources for thinking um, very, it, um, with great clarity. Um, about what it is we would want to measure and what would be politically and socially useful to measure for all sorts of reasons. Um, and so, yes, I can direct you towards those things. Now, people have been doing sex gender research in other fields, so you also might want to look to social neuroendocrinology um, and certain areas within the epidemiology of sex differences that have looked at the way gendered lifestyle factors also interact with sex-related biological factors to produce the kinds of stratifications that we see in health outcomes. So you, there are resources out there. It's not new to do sex gender research. Um, but there is a growing community of excitement around doing this work. So thanks. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, so I had a question, on, I would say, on a similar vein. Uh, so when you describe the uh, things about each cell having different epigenetic, uh, uh, like epigenetic signaling for uh, determining what sex is, so could you conceptualize uh, individuals who are uh, transgender as having basically an issue with the, uh, basically the signaling epigenetically uh, being different in their brains compared to other organs? Uh, like sexual organs or others, uh, and that is like the basically this this uh, disconnect between uh, how the epigenetic signaling is working is uh, having them have the identity that they are. Um, so I think people are interested in epigenetic research within uh, research on uh, transgender um, individuals. I would. Um, uh, contest just slightly the way that you framed that, which is um, the notion that we would expect trans individuals to have an issue with their epigenetic programming. I would rather want to suggest that there might be great, a great range of normal phenotypic variation, um, and that we're going to be able to see that if we keep a, an open mind, um, if we look at these many cofactors. Um, and processes of mosaicism and change over the life course uh, might lead us away from a no notion of transgender, that is, as pathological. Um, since the new requirement that cells be uh, sex balanced, has there been any notable findings of significance in terms of that new variable? Uh, so the, the policy isn't quite in place yet. Um, <clears throat> I do want to clarify that lots of, there are lots of people looking at sex variables in basic preclinical research, including animal models, cell lines, and cells. Um, what this policy does is require consideration of sex variables, and it's only just now going into place. So um, we haven't seen a kind of shift in research. Um, there's all sorts of technical debates about how to put it into place, just what, what, what the requirements will be. Um, for example, not everyone will be required to look at both male and female um, specimens if they can justify a reason within their research that they would not have to. So for example, if you're doing prostate cancer research, there may not be as much of a reason to look at female um, variables. Um, 
So I don't know, um, but there are lots of interesting and significant findings from people who look at XXY and XY cells, for example, um, or cell lines. Um, however, the question is whether those findings can tell us anything about embodied sex differences in humans. So if you're the National Institutes of Health, your concern and justification for any policy has to be this will advance human health. And the, the question at the heart of the con contestation around this new policy is whether a male, uh, an XX and an XY cell in a Petri dish models male and female bodies in the world. Um, and so there are big questions about that kind of leap of reasoning. Um, I'm not sure I fully answered your question. Won't that yeah. question be answered as this research emerges? Because they're going to go ahead and do it. It's required. And therefore, won't we find out the answer to that question you have? Uh, well, my answer would be no um, for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, Oh, uh, the question is about the institution of this new policy about studying um, XX, or rather, uh, male and female derived materials in preclinical research. Um, so, cells, tissues, um, cell lines, animal models, and so on. Um, so, the reason I don't think it will be well answered by this um, is because. Um, it requires people who are not specialized in sex difference research to include sex as a variable. In often underpowered studies in which uh, sex is not rigor rigorously looked at in terms of in intersecting variables. So I think it will produce a lot of findings that have uncertain meaning or significance, biological significance. Um, so it, it will probably be a muddle. Um, but the other reason is that is what I said before, that those kinds of models, uh, so my contention is that you can't study sex outside of gender, um, and so you're going to have a set of findings that have little relevance to actual human health. Um, so I reject the hypothesis that it's not perfect, but we should do it anyway because it will move us closer to sex gender. But I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. Thank you. Um... Is the is it working? Okay. Um, uh, so I guess uh, one question was, you know, I was intrigued by the moment with the rat and the methylation and the yeah. demethylation, and I, I just wondered if you could flesh out a little bit how people are, I guess at this point, probably speculating <coughs> about what some of those cofactors might be, like in a more social sense, right? Like because they're talking about just giving a drug that would produce these effects. So what are people speculating about? as this sort of change over the life course mm -hmm. um, might be like those cofactors, um, like right. what what actually produces this plasticity or affects it. Uh, so that's one question. And then the other question is just, you know, you're saying it's going to be a kind of contestation over the meaning, and that seems totally true. But I wondered whether to take your caution about the way that plasticity and programming are linked to suggest that some of the what I am familiar with is a kind of more utopian speculation or theorizing about plasticity and epigenetics that's happening, whether you want to really add a note of caution to that or you want to say, go for it, we need a lot more thinking on that that is non-essentialist and non-binary, if you see what I'm saying. Is right. it a sort of caution that that speculative thinking is always going to be sort of recaptured or is it really a call to, to do a lot more um, transformative thinking about this research. Right. Um, so on the first question, what are some of the environmental factors that could, could create plasticity, such as that observed in, that was a study in rats, I want to underscore <laughs> rats, and in the preoptic area of rats, which is sexually dimor more sexually dimorphic than in humans. Um, but uh, I have heard a lot of speculation. A lot of it focuses on the um, fetal period and on early development. Um, and that might include exposures ranging from uh, diet to drugs. I've um, heard some speculation about um, uh, actually uh, Tylenol um, as being a major mediator of that. Um, so it could be anything um, like that, but it could also be various forms of um, social interaction, right, postnatally. One thing that the study seemed to suggest is that adults could flip 
their sexual phenotype in their brains. So that's a rather different model than the fetal programming. So uh, I guess the, the game's wide open for looking at potential variables that could lead to epigenetic changes. The question, of course, is whether those epigenetic changes are fleeting or whether they become fixed under certain conditions. Um, yeah, so what is my argument really about plasticity, right? I am adding a note of caution. Um, I do not think we should uncritically celebrate new sciences of plasticity. First, we should understand empirically what they can actually do, um, but also we should be aware that um, Plasticity doesn't have the political implications necessarily that we assume it does. It can be, um, has this flip side of programming. Uh, I definitely think that um, we should, however, I don't want to suggest that we shouldn't be excited about this new science. So um, I'm working in this complicated space where um, there's possible potential there. That research hasn't been done so far. I do see some people, the orphan black fans and so on, <laughs> uh, and I am one of them, um, you know, who make over, uh, who make hyped statements about what epigenetics is, what it has shown so far, and that's not the space we want to be in. Um, so keeping our critical lenses on while hoping that this provides a new tool for asking the hard, hard questions that people working at the intersection of gender, sexuality, and sex have been asking for a long time. Think that thinking about some of the practical aspects of the research you'd like to see done brings up the question, in my mind, of cost. And I hate to be, but, but yeah. this, is, this is a real factor in people that are doing research. If it now takes about $1,000 to do a human genome, how much does it take to look at, at the methylation for one human genome? Ah, oh, that I don't know. Um, okay, that's critical. If yeah. you've got to look at this kind of work, you have to know that stuff. Well, there, what are used are, um, uh, alumina microarray chips and other methods that are um, now becoming standardized to study uh, methylation across the genome. You do not need to sequence a genome to do it. We have lots of sequenced genomes. Um, you can then look at existing samples and existing um, sequences to look at methylation patterns. So I don't think... Um, I, I, I'll, epigenetics is, research is going forward. It's being used not just in sex gender research, but in the pharmaceutical industry and all across the life sciences to flesh out the path, biological pathways. So um, I think it's, it is not like it's a different field than genomics or more expensive than genomics or somehow di uh, dispensable. It's indispensable. You now can't think without epigenetic cofactors. Um, the expense question, the question of cost is interesting, though, on the level of the kinds of questions we decide as a society to fund. So um, you're right that questions that seem to have a lot of relevance for human health um, in biology uh, might get more funding than questions that seem to get at these theoretical issues of the interaction of socially gendered factors and human sexed behaviors. Um, these are theoretically interesting. They're interesting within the social sciences. But when I talk to scientists in the, this field, they often have trouble getting funding for their research unless they can suggest that that has a health implication. And those who work on areas like um, uh, sexuality, that's hot button research that they say that they have a hard time funding um, because it's not within, usually conceptualized as being within the purview of um, health problems that uh, are at the top of the list, you know, for national funding. So it's a great question. Always follow the money. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, I'm not entirely clear on how you would suggest we operationalize looking at sex gender variation when working with either um, cells or animal models in particular. I'm just wondering if you had some specific suggestions for how people may look outside of the binary. Just, simply, mm -hmm. just thinking um, if there's variation, not just within. Yes, yes. Doing this research is very complex and resource intensive. 
Um, you know, if you're, uh, so, so this research is already done with animal models. You do different caging scenarios, you do different rearing scenarios, and then you could study um, epigenetic pathways related to that, those kinds of social exposures in cells exactly as you suggested. You could look at different ages, you could look at different environmental um, exposures and see how the milieu changes mechanisms within that cell. That said, as I said in answer to the gentleman in the front, um, I do think that actually just cells are going to be a poor system for studying sex and gender. Um, they're good for some things, but they're probably not a good way to study s sex gender, although we might validate some models in which they're useful um, if you're looking at very particular kinds of, of interactions. But whole systems, whole embodied systems uh, are really what we need to get at to understand how the gendered interactions of everyday life from the moment we're born um, play a role in shaping our biological repertoires. So part of my critique is just that cell preclinical research is not actually a great realm <laughs> to be doing this research. Yes, there's a new study out by Sari Van Anders at University of Michigan, who's a social neuroendocrinologist. You might want to look at her work, um, where she's looking at, um, so we usually assume that testosterone levels are innate and biologically determined and highly binary between males and females. And indeed, the baseline level of testosterone is um, highly binary. Um, however, what she showed is that there is um, uh, also a contextual um, basis to rises and falls in levels of testosterone so that um, women who are in competitive um, leadership scenarios, um, whether or not they use male tip stereotypical or female stereotypical patterns of behavior, um, have a much greater spike in testosterone than males do in those scenarios. It shows um, what, sh what she argues, and this is just one paper, I think it's proof of concept and kind of suggesting an avenue to go down rather than a final <laughs> answer to this question. It shows that even something as considered as innate and binary as, as testosterone is actually context dependent and specifically responsive to gender specific signals. So um, rather exciting, uh, lots of research to be done there. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you.